today about making conservation pay, earning money while doing good. Um, I don't, we don't do things that earn us money to not meet our mission. That's the first important thing that you need to recognize. You don't want to do something that's going to drive you away from what you're supposed to be doing. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about stream and wetlands mitigation. I'd like to talk to you about um, a working cattle ranch. I'd like to talk to you about the work we're doing, if you've been here a little earlier, with the Rice Game Changers Initiative and with Russ Conser's Standard Soil. And I'd also talk to you a little bit about ecosystem services. So if we'll do the first slide, uh, uh, second slide, sorry. Just so you know, um, if you don't know this, Katy Prairie originally went all the way from our Loop 610 out to the Brazos River, up to 290, down to 10. It was about, could be anywhere from 500,000 to 750,000. Obviously, that whole gray area is not where we're working because it's all developed. <laughs> and the zoo is uh, even in closer in than the loop. Um, but it, it's, it's run over. And more and more it's run over because, as you can see right here, there's um, Highway 99 or the Grand Parkway that is exciting lots of development. <coughs> Go to the next one. Okay, th this is the land that we have currently. We own, a, a, well, we protected a little more than 20,000 acres. Uh, we own about a uh, little under 14,000. We have conservation easements on 3,000, and the rest is in a public-private partnership in which eventually we will hold the conservation easements. So purple is what is eased. Green is our ownership. Um, next one. Um, in 2003 and 2004, we got to buy um, an undivided interest, the majority interest, in the Warren Ranch, a 6,500-acre cattle ranch. With that was a great opportunity, but also a huge challenge. We tried to mount a $20 million campaign, basically from philanthropic sources, so the Houston Endowment, the Brown Foundation, all those groups, to raise the money to not only buy the land, but to put an endowment on it so that we could actually manage the land. We didn't succeed. We raised about $2 million. We had 90 days in which to buy this property, or it was going to be subdivided. And so we ended up um, taking the <coughs> faith, that goodness I have the board that I did, and they probably regret it later, but we took the loan with Capital Farm Credit, uh, Agricultural Land Trust Bank, Land Bank, and uh, we had a $14.8 million mortgage that we had to somehow figure out how to service over 20 years. Um, that's about a million dollars a year with interest. And Trust me, capital farm credit doesn't seem to go with the rest of the world in terms of interest rates. It's usually higher. But uh, they do get a uh, patronage refund, so somehow you get that a little bit lower. So we had to figure out what were we going to do? Um, how are we going to actually pay for that? Because, you know, I told you that the philanthropic agencies didn't give us the money in the beginning. Well, they don't like to pay down debt either. So you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. You couldn't get it in the beginning, you can't get it once you have the mortgage. So what we did was we started looking around. And in 2008, we got lucky. Uh, we had always been working on in-lieu fee mitigation, which meant that somebody would need, they were impacting a stream or a wetland, uh, not a stream at the time, they were impacting a wetland, and they would need to actually <coughs> mitigate for that. I mean, to restore that damage because of the no net loss of wetlands. So we had made a fair amount of money until the Swank ruling, in which they said that isolated wetlands were not protected under the U.S. waters, the waters of the U.S. So suddenly, a source of money that had been pretty wonderful for us, pretty substantial, um, was gone. But in 2007, 2008, we'd been working with a group of. Uh, uh, Lee Forbes, who's now with the SWCA group, and Kevin Shanley, who's with the SWA group. And they were working on water quality, bayous, water issues. And they started talking to us about whether or not we would ever be interested in working with a for-profit partner. And we've really not done that. I mean, we have <coughs> oil and gas interests on our land. We, we lease to hunters and farmers who are for-profit. But we never really got into a joint venture with anybody. We got lucky. We got a group called Restoration Systems out of North Carolina. They had been in business doing stream restoration um, on the East Coast for quite a few years. They were good at it. They knew what they were doing. And they came to us and they asked, would we consider doing a stream mitigation project on the Warren Ranch? Um, if we do the next one, the good, um, ben, Benjamin, the, ne the good thing about this is, and you can see it with these colored areas, is that there were five streams that we could impact, restore, enhance, bring back to <coughs> life 
on the ridge, about 100,000 linear feet of stream. And so we put together a prospectus, we did all of the due diligence, we checked their references, and then we put in a proposal to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Galveston District. Now I told you that they did a lot of work on the East Coast. You'll find lots of parts of the country do stream mitigation. The Galveston District had never done it. And so we were a first. We were a guinea pig. Well, what that meant was we submitted a proposal in early 2009. It was until 2000, 2012 that we did not get approval to do that project. So it took a long time. We were the sort of uh, guinea pigs, I guess, for that. But it was, it was pretty exciting when we finally got it. So what we did is, and I think we, if we look at the next slide, you'll see it. Up there, you'll see phase one of the Warren Creek. That is classic mitigation bank. And what I mean by that is, is that you get approval and you get to release a certain number of acres, uh, I'm sorry, credits. So that is about 17,000 linear feet that we were gonna be impacting, uh, both sides of the, the stream as well as the stream bed. And we were able to get 50,000 credits that we could sell. So every linear, linear foot had three credits. Now those Credits could be sold for $250 each. Um, I think at the time we were selling them for $215. And um, the way that a classic mitigation bank goes is that when you get approval, you get to release a certain number of the credits. We got to release 20% of the credits. We had already willing buyers. So we immediately got a million dollars. Now you could say, well, that's not very much money. A million dollars? What's that? <laughs> well, remember, we are only getting 20% of the gross revenues from that. We have a joint venture partner. We have an undivided interest co-owner. So 20% came to us, 7.5% went to the co-owner, and 72.5% went to the joint venture partner. Now again, that seems pretty uneven, but remember, we had no cost other than the land. Now the land's expensive, don't get me wrong, but we already were gonna buy it no matter what. And the added advantage that we got, in addition to getting money from this bank, is guess what? We got to do restoration work that we could not afford to do by ourselves. Um, and while it's a working cattle ranch, I can tell you that at that time, it was not being managed very well. It is now, and I'll talk about that later when we talk about the working ranch. But, but at the time, it was not. It had you know, degraded wetlands. Its, its creeks were a little more than ditches. Um, this, the, the, the sides of each of those, the, the, the banks of the creeks were not in good shape. They were, cattle were run over them. The quality of the water within those creeks was obviously um, um, polluted, or no, I shouldn't say polluted, was not going to meet any standards because cattle roamed in it, uh, other animals could roam in it. So we got a twofer. We got money and we got the ability to actually restore things that we, would, we wanted to do, we would have done if we had the money. So, so we went ahead and, and did that, and so, uh, next slide. So this is what started it out looking out. And one of the things you'll see is that in the, in the uh, slide you had before, the creeks looked pretty straight. They had been channelized, they hadn't been concreted in, thank goodness, <coughs> but basically they had been channelized so that the water could move through it quickly. People didn't want the water on the land, the farmers and ranchers, they wanted it to move. Well, we wanted to put the sinuosity back in because we wanted to slow down the water. We wanted to make sure that the water was held, slowed down, and would help downstream, you know, be flooding attenuation for downstream areas. Again, a benefit to the region, um, also something that was a benefit to us because the more water that was there, the more likely we could use it because we have the right of capture in Texas, and so we could use that. So. That, that worked out. It took us, one thing that I, I will also tell you, another lesson that we learned about this, we are conservationists, and while I may not be the person who knows all about the birds and the bees and the, you know, be the botany and the biology, I have good staff on it, and I have good people who lease our lands, and they know a lot about it. And one thing that, that didn't work to our advantage in working with people who came from North Carolina is that they didn't really know the ecosystem very well, and they didn't listen in the beginning. So because we had had such a, a, low, a slow start and such a long delay, they wanted to just nuke it and get rid of the invasive species. And instead of doing a prescribed burn, which we wanted them to do, they instead did a lot of mechanical means 
and a lot of pesticide. And they didn't realize that that was going to probably bring back a lot of the invasive species. And we've been right. They also didn't realize that they didn't really to, do, need to, to um, uh, dig out as much as they did. This is very flat. And what they needed to do was to use the natural contours that we had. Now, they've learned since in other parts of it, but in, in this particular part, and it, it is looking really nice, with the exception of <coughs> the, the native species. We're still having a struggle on this phase one. But the other part of it is, is that phase one got constructed within that year. Um, one of the things that you have to look at in terms of your success criteria with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is that um, do you have two uh, <coughs> events in which the banks hold and they keep the water in and they warp the way they're supposed to function, but they also look at your vegetative, co co um, vegetative cover and they also look at what you do in um, terms of the native uh, plant material. Also, you should also know it has to be fenced in. One thing that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers does not let you do right now is use prescribed burns after you've actually gotten approval and done it. We could have done it beforehand. And they don't let you use cattle. And cattle, as you heard from Brian's thing, can be an incredible uh, management tool. Um, but you need to get them in. And maybe get them out quickly, but, but get them in, get them out. And we couldn't do that. Um, we're still working on that, but that's one thing that, as a working cattle ranch, we would like to have access to what ultimately would be another 500 acres. Having it fenced in is not a problem, though, because at least in terms of the conservancy, eventually it would mean that we would be able to have a trail system on some of those creeks, at least, and people wouldn't be, um, you know, like me one day when the cattle kept coming closer and closer to me, and I am sure they're going to attack me at the time, um, not realizing they were just looking for food, and they figured that I was going to give them some. Um, we do want to have people, uh, not necessarily in the same places that you know, the working ranch is, but to be able to see it. So, um, next slide. So you'll see this is an aerial view that's later that things are starting to come in. And there are a lot of natural wetlands. We didn't get credit for those wetlands. Um, in future times, we might do it a little differently. Next one. Um, and you can see. Um, and and it's, it's functioning really well. Um, um, but, but the other thing that's now I want to talk about, let's see if, what the next slide is, and it may not be. Yeah, okay, we'll go with this one. One thing that's very interesting, I told you that the first part, phase one, was a classic bank. Three other segments of it, F1, F2, and G, which were affectionately called that because they were mitigating <laughs> for impacts on the Grand Parkways, F1, F2, and G. Not on the Katy Prairie. Katy Prairie's segment is E. They did not have any stream impacts, they said, and they only did, I think, mitigation for 28 acres of wetlands, which, another story. But anyway, so when, when TxDOT realized that we were the only stream bank in town. They didn't really want to come to us because we didn't fight the, the Grand Parkway, but we certainly didn't support it. What we tried to do was to get more mitigation requirements there, um, and we didn't even succeed in that. But they sort of held their nose, and they went to our for-profit partner, and they did decide to actually mitigate. And it's a different kind. It's called permittee responsible mitigation. And what that means is they're still on the hook for it. I mean, even though we're the consultants to them, we're doing the work, they, they are looked at by the Army Corps of Engineers as being responsible for doing it correctly. But it also meant that they paid all their money up front, and the project was done, and you didn't have to release credits. Remember I told you before we only could release 10,000 of Phase 1? Well, we are waiting for the Corps to let us release the next 33,000 because we've met other criteria which to us will be another 1.5 million and to the other guys a lot more money. But the, the <coughs> truth is is that with the, the text dot, with those three segments, we got $6 million right up front and the work was done um, within about another year, but we didn't have to go through those phases. So the Corps does not like to do permittee responsible mitigation. They want it to be a classic bank because then they know what they've got. They know that you are meeting those, those uh, goals, those objectives. If it's permittee responsible <coughs> mitigation, you don't have the time frame, the seven to nine years, to prove that you've done what you said you're going to do. But it's great from our perspective because the money comes up front. Um, and so that is an important thing to do. And I, I want to give you a couple of lessons about, about working with 
um, mitigators before I go to the, the ranch and, and on the, the soil thing. But mm. that is, you need to know who they are. You need to know that they do good work. You need to check their references. You need to make sure they're compatible with you. But another thing that's really important is make sure they understand what your values are. And that in doing these kinds of projects, that the work has to be done up to your standards. Brian talked a lot about that, wanting not to get in, in bed with somebody that suddenly you realize, oh, I want to do this, they want to do this, and they're totally incompatible. You need to make sure that it fits. We had lots of mitigation companies talk to us. They weren't right. And lots of mitigators just do this for the money. And that's OK. They're for-profit entities if that's what they want to do. We're doing this forever. And we also have, in addition to the money we make for this, because we own this land, we also have a long-term management fund that will be about $2 million, which we use, we'll use the interest on that every year to make sure that we maintain and manage these 100,000 linear feet of the stream. So that's really important to us. We're also working with this group on a wetlands mitigation bank. And I, I think in the future, um, and that's a different split, it's a 50-50 split, but it's also the case that we're paying 50% of the expenses <coughs> and we're earning 50% of the, um, the revenues. The difference there is, is that we might do it by ourselves in the future because we have the expertise to do it. Um, we might do the stream in the, in the future and just use consultants. But the other thing you have to watch out for is what's your competition? We were really lucky with this stream bank. We were the first one out of the chute. There is no other stream bank in this particular service area. We are it. So if people want stream credits, they have to come to us. Whether they like us or not, whether they care about our values, they have to come to us. And so that's important. If you have 10 stream banks in the place, what does it do? They may all be sold, but you might sell it for a lot less money. So you have to really be careful. And there's a Petey Cypress mitigation bank that Audubon is going to be the um, Hold the owner of when they when it was finished, and now they've graciously said that we would be the owner of it because it's on the Katy Prairie. Prairie, they thought they were going to make a gazillion dollars of it. The last credits that they were selling, they were begging people to take them off their hands for uh, an acre of wetlands for $250. Today's acres of wetlands actually get fifty to sixty thousand dollars for a wetland credit, and so that's why this is really you know, lucrative and wonderful. But there are a lot of pitfalls to it and a lot of things. So having a joint venture, venture partner for the first part of it is really good. The other thing I would tell you is make sure you have the ability to check their financial records, that you have the ability to audit their materials, um, especially if you're in it where it's a cost share and you want to know. And again, it's not about thinking they're untrustworthy. It's about doing good business. Because, you know, nonprofits are, for me, a frame of mind. They're not a way of doing business. We should be making money just as everybody else is. We're just putting that money back into more land that we save, more conservation, more restoration, whatever we do. Next slide. Um, I told you that the ranch wasn't in great shape when we first started. Um, the family that owned it really had wanted to uh, subdivide it and be um, a major housing development. They were going to work with the, the division, the subdivision um, uh, owner and make a lot of money and we got in the middle of the way because we had bought the land in two parts. The first part made us a member of the family. The second part meant that we could match the, um, the offers. We, we got in there and we put in a uh, ranch manager. Uh, first our conservation stewardship director managed it, trying to do two jobs, and then we hired a ranch manager. Next slide. And one of the things that's been really interesting about this, it's 6,500 acres. We could easily handle at least 700 cows, head of cows, but uh, head of cattle. But we only have about 350 right now, and that's not by choice. It's just because in the beginning we didn't have the resources to actually have that many cows on the land because it was as Brian showed you, it was grazed down to a nub. You could barely see a blade of grass. And one of the things that we've done is we've <coughs> actually implemented a sustainable grazing plan. Whether Brian had come along or not, that was our goal because we have gotten funding from the Dixon Water Foundation to do that. And we started looking at inputs and outputs. We had hay on our land that we actually did. Uh, that was a product we sold. We sold cattle, and then we actually leased to a peanut farmer and to um, uh, uh, corn. 
we did not actually do any more love. It used to be the families, half of them loved rice, farm rice, half of them loved cattle. So anyway, what we did is um, we started these sustainable grazing practices, and one of the things that we found was that the hay didn't make us any money. It lost us money. We had to work so hard to get hay, and when people have hay, everybody has hay. When people don't have hay, nobody has hay. So it didn't help us. But, but we needed the hay to actually supplement feeding. Uh, so we kept producing hay, but just not for sale and not at the level that we did. We also found out, though, having cattle meant that we would get 44 to $60 net from every head of cattle that we had, that every 10 acres. So it was really, the cattle for us was going to be the, the sort of cash cow, so to speak. And so, I had to say that, I'm sorry. My husband is a punster, and I rarely do it, but because I'm not good at it. That one, that was easy. Um, so anyway, so, um, and, then, and then we also realized that when we lease it for farming, we get about $23 an acre. And, or 25, and that's not even particularly competitive, but we'd be much better off actually having the cows on it. So, so now we are actually working with this, um, we hope that we'll be in the study area, I don't know if they've gotten their funding yet, but with the Shell Game Changers uh, initiatives, working with Rice University to look at the impact of cattle um, and this, the grazing practices on the soil and on the, the, the diversity and on the sequestration of carbon. And so we're trying to do that. But we're also looking with, um, uh, working with Russ on a project that he's doing with his company called Standard Soil, which is really interesting because remember I told you about wanting to do things that help drive our mission. He's been looking at how he can go and lease degraded lands, um, put cattle on them, and bring that land back. He makes money, but he also restores your land for you, so it improves the soil, it improves the biodiversity of it. And last but not least, because we can say that, and working hopefully with Audubon, and even with these other in, um, practices that we're doing, that we can say we are actually improving our product, it's a better story at the store. We get to have a branded product and not just be with everybody else that, oh, where does that cow come from? Not only do you know what that, where that cow comes from, you know that the practices were humane, you know that the practices were good for that cow, and hopefully it means that the meat that you're eating tastes better. That's, that's the hope. So, so anyway, so that's another thing we do. And then, next slide, thank you. Um, we've also been working on ecosystem services. You know, um, Houston is flat. We have a lot of problems with flooding. Our Harris County Flood Control Pro, uh, District does not say that it eliminates flooding. It manages flooding. So that means your streets flood, your highways flood, lots of things flood. But if they can um, help hold some of that water a little bit longer, then they're going to pay for that. We are in the middle of trying to do a $360 million Cypress Creek overflow project, which um, Study so far, it's only been 18 months. If you do the next slide, I mean, obviously you see the grass, um, the, the roots there. Uh, an 18 month of a five year study that looks at the absorptive qualities of the grasses. Um, open space holds about 1.86 inches over a 24 hour period. Past, I'm sorry, an open space, native prairies, holds 8.65 inches. Um, the pastures hold about 1.86 and the improved areas, like developed areas like that, hold about 0.45 inches. So it's a huge difference. Now, obviously, if it's saturated, the water's going to go somewhere. But the more land that we can buy, and the more land that we can put back in prairie, the better off we are about saving not just, you know, Attucks and Barker Reservoir, which are among the top three reservoirs in the United States that have the potential for catastrophic, catastrophic damage, but we can also help River Oaks. We can help downtown Houston. People should be paying the Cape Prairie Conservancy every month to buy land, seriously. In your water bill, in your mm -hmm. rebuild Houston, you should have a little charge that says you have to only opt out. You, you don't have to opt in, you're automatically opt in. But, but the point is, for $360 million, um, of which $60 million could have gone to the Conservancy, except that we're nice guys and we want to see the project done, Instead, we said, use that $60 million to buy more land and let us own it. 
we could get 6,000 extra acres of land that we could protect that could hold water. And so, um, and then, um, and then uh, about $60 million of it is actually infrastructure improvements along Bear Creek that would have 750 to 1,000 acres on either side of the creek so that the water could flow through, it's called a frontier uh, approach to uh, flood control. And we um, also, uh, then the, the $240 million is actually to purchase the land. Land that, you know, we probably couldn't afford to buy by ourselves <coughs> could actually be permanently conserved. So it does a couple things. It, it conserves more land, it has that land available to hold water when it needs to be, but it also can be used for recreational purposes. If any of you are from the Houston area, you know that Bear Creek floods at times, but other times you see kids playing soccer in it, they, there's an archery club there, there's lots of things that aren't damaged by heavy duty water. Um, and it also helps us with res restoration. The, um, the regulation part of this they are actually looking at requiring some of the development to, developers to do prairie mitigation. Well, guess who they're going to come to, at least we hope, is us. If we've been successful, and Jaime probably, and I unfortunately couldn't be here yesterday because we had a, a big board meeting yesterday that I was getting ready for, but probably talked about some of the prairie pockets that he's doing and some of the prairie restoration, and we're becoming the go-to people when people want to know, how do I do this? What do I do this? Along with Jim Willis, along with a lot of other a lot more, a lot of other good people who we're helping to begin to develop a core of people among the prairie community, not us alone, but as a partner, to say, hey, here's how you do it. I know Larry, Larry Elaine said, keep every you know remnant you can get, and that's important too, but also if you can't have all the remnants, how do you start doing some of those things? And then last but not least, I mean, we are looking all the time to partner with other people. Um, Shell was also looking at one point doing switchgrass um, farms because again, they were looking at it for um, the actual, um, I guess it was a, um, a biofuel. Bi biofuel, thank you, I was gonna say ethanol, but biofuel, um, a, an alternative to corn crops. And, and it didn't really fit our mission, so we ended up not doing it. Um, I'm sure they will go to other farmers and ranchers to do that kind of thing. But I think the thing that is important is to be as creative as you can be, to think about what are other people doing in other parts of the country that we might be able to bring to Texas. 